Welcome to episode 13 of The Crisis, a day-by-day -day account of Britain's 1931 crisis brought to you 90 years on. In our last episode, we saw how the national government passed its emergency budget amidst heavy controversy and dogged labor opposition. The budget promised a balanced budget and was supposed to secure international confidence in the British financial system. However, within days, the confidence crisis would reach fever pitch and the gold standard would have to be abandoned. The 16th of September 1931 marked the start of a concerted effort by the Conservative Party to force a general election. The balance was now balanced, and they now saw the balance of payments issue in the form of the trade deficit as the chief issue facing the country that must be cured via tariffs. To do this, the Conservatives wanted to call an election on the tariff issue. However, Tory leaders did not wish to see an election fought on traditional party lines, as the original national government agreement had intended. Instead, they wanted MacDonald and his followers to remain with them in this fight and beyond. The editorial of the Times on the 16th of September called for a national appeal, an election in which the national government fought labor. Jeffrey Dawson, the paper's editor and ally of Baldwin, wrote, quote, Surely the task of national recovery would be better carried through to the end by the men whose bond of union is that that they had the courage to begin it. At the very least, it is from their united leaders that the first appeal to the country should come. Effectively, the Conservative Party no longer wished the national government to break up after six weeks. Instead, they saw it as a useful vehicle with which to defeat Labour decisively. One Conservative wrote in private to Dawson, McDonald's, quote, political corpse is worth a lot of seats. In order to achieve this, however, as the Times hinted that day, certain ministers would need to be forced out of the coalition. The Conservatives knew that free trade liberals such as Herbert Samuel would never agree to a protectionist platform. Instead, they wanted Macdonald to replace the free traders with the faction of the Liberal Party that supported Sir John Simon and were open to the idea of tariffs. On the same day as the Times editorial, or possibly two days before, Baldwin saw MacDonald in private and asked for the national government to be reconstituted along these lines, and then an election held. MacDonald himself was torn. He had no wish to remove the Liberals, but equally, he could not ignore the wishes of the largest party in his coalition. He also believed that an election would in effect be the end of his political career, as he would have no party to lead. Later, on the 16th, the cabinet met and discussed the government's future. MacDonald sided with the two liberals in the cabinet, Herbert Samuel and Lord Redding, but was outvoted by the four conservatives, supported by Philip Snowden and J. H. Thomas, who all voted for an election to be held at the earliest possible opportunity. The liberal and conservative organizations were ordered to negotiate arrangements over seats. It therefore appeared that an election contested by the national government was inevitable and imminent. However, on what platform remained totally unclear. With so much election talk, Britain was entering a renewed period of political uncertainty just three weeks after the formation of the national government that was supposed to have brought stability. In an age before opinion polling, there could be no certainty about the outcome of an election and the Labour opposition had made it clear that their platform would be total opposition to cuts. Suppose Labour won the election. Would that mean the emergency budget would be ripped up? Nothing could now be taken for granted. Amidst this deep uncertainty, three separate crises would break over the next few days to create a perfect financial storm. The first of the crises to break was a protest against pay cuts amongst the sailors of the Royal Navy's Atlantic Fleet, labeled the Invergordon Mutiny. The events of the 16th of September were far more a display of passive disobedience rather than a mutiny. Nevertheless, the impact on confidence of the Royal Navy of all institutions protesting against cuts cannot be exaggerated. On the 15th to 16th of September, sailors on four capital ships refused to put to sea and instead sat on the decks and ignored orders, effectively going on strike over the unjustness of some of the pay cuts being imposed, which ran contrary to agreements established during earlier pay disputes for naval ratings under certain contracts. The first Lord of the Admiralty, Austin Chamberlain, older brother of Neville, was bitter about missing out on a place in the national government's emergency cabinet of 10, and therefore completely failed to appreciate the potential problems in the ranks, did not make any inquiries after the first reports of trouble, and also failed to tell the cabinet about the developing crisis. In the aforementioned cabinet meeting of the 16th of September, the ministers quizzed Chamberlain and Admiralty officials. They had to tread a fine line, desperately wanting to end the mutiny, but not wishing to be 
seen to give in to the first resistance to the program of cuts. McDonald made a statement insisting that the concerns of those unfairly affected would be addressed and that this would have a negligible impact on the balancing of the budget. The mutiny was quelled and the fleet dispersed under orders. On the same day as the naval troubles began, an Indian crisis also broke out. The colonial government of India had been suffering acute financial problems since July. At its heart lay the concern of British financial interests over their investments and assets in India as negotiations over a new Indian constitution were underway with the promise of self-government in the so-called Second Round Table Conference of September 1931. Essentially, many British investors were afraid that the government would give in to the Indian nationalists and devalue the rupee. Just as Britain was suffering a sterling crisis, so had the colonial authorities been desperately attempting to defend the rupee since August. By early September, it was clear that a, quote, really formidable crisis had developed and that Britain and India would sink or swim together. The British and colonial Indian governments were at loggerheads, and top Indian civil service officials such as George Schuster, the head of finance in the government of India, threatened resignation. By the 17th, the India office in London, headed by conservative Sir Samuel Hoare, had imposed a financial settlement on India in the form of deep budget cuts, including to civil service salaries and sharp tax rises. Events in Invergordon in India had caused almighty shocks on the world financial markets and had deeply shaken confidence in sterling once again. This now intersected with the crisis over an election, with the Bank of England sure that the apparent threat of breakup of the national government would only harm confidence further. The fact that Labour was so firmly opposed to the national government, showing that it was not a national government at all, had already negated the initial bounce the new cabinet had brought. Now that an election was on the cards, there was a good deal of upset on the markets. Historian Philip Williamson blames both the Labour and Conservative parties in equal measure for this fresh confidence crisis. Labor were obstinately opposing any cuts, thereby undermining the impact on confidence of the emergency budget and national government as a whole. The conservatives, meanwhile, were forcing through an election at exactly the time the markets wanted stability and certainty. On the 17th of September, MacDonald asked the Bank of England their opinion on an election. The reply was that, quote, it would be impossible with existing resources to maintain the gold standard during the period necessary to conduct a general election. The bank advised that the national government should announce there would be no election in the near future. However, this was not politically possible for MacDonald. That same day, as the election uncertainty combined with the Invergordon and Indian crises, the bank lost four million pounds, and it was predicted reserves would be dry in ten days. Things were as bad as they had been in August. Around midnight on the 17th of September, news arrived of a banking crisis in Amsterdam. The European liquidity crisis that had started in Germany and Austria in the summer was showing no signs of abating. On Friday the 18th of September, the flight from Sterling worsened, and no less than £18 million was lost. The Bank of England directors were aghast at the attitude of the national government and particularly its conservative members. They also believed that the government's reaction to Invergordon, in essence giving in, had had a deplorable impact abroad, much worse than the mutiny itself. In effect, the financial markets were far more worried by the signs of weakness in a government prepared to abandon its cuts at the first sign of trouble than by the sit-down protest on the Royal Navy's warships. If naval ratings were to be protected, would every public sector worker be able to protest their way out of equal sacrifice? Given the impossibility of the situation, the bank directors unilaterally made the decision that the gold standard must be abandoned. It was simply impossible to stem the tide any longer. They told the politicians the following day, the 19th. MacDonald was recalled from the Prime Minister's country residence of Chequers and told by the bank's deputy governor, Ernest Harvey, that the bank would use the weekend to prepare the ground and that emergency legislation would have to be passed on Monday the 21st with the bank authorized to suspend gold payments. MacDonald informed his most important colleagues that day and the cabinet on the 20th, exactly four weeks after the collapse of the Labour government. The Labour leader, Arthur Henderson, was also informed on the 20th. All party cooperation would be needed to pass the legislation taking Britain off the gold standard in a single day. Henderson promised loyal support and delivered the following day, much to the chagrin of many Labour backbenchers.
the issue effectively became a non-political one as the Independent Bank of England made all the arrangements, including for the stock exchange to remain closed on the 21st. But banks remained open to prevent alarm, and the Board of Trade worked with food wholesalers to avoid immediate price rises and therefore panic. Chancellor Philip Snowden had reassuring words for the nation, telling them that, quote, the pound will not go the way of the mark. There is not the slightest cause for the least anxiety about the money you have in the banks. It would be silly to indulge in panic buying and hoarding. Equally, the Treasury's official press notice of the decision proved highly effective. Quote, it is one thing to go off the gold standard with an unbalanced budget and uncontrolled inflation. It is quite another thing to take this measure, not because of internal financial difficulties, but because of excessive withdrawals of borrowed capital. Everything passed off smoothly, despite the humiliation felt by ministers in private. The skillful presentation of the measure worked perfectly. Sterling fell from its gold parity of £1 to $4.86 to around $3.85 at the end of the week, far from a calamitous fall and much closer to the true value of the currency. By 1934, sterling would rise to considerably higher than its gold standard era value, at £1 to $5.04 with Britain's recovery from the Depression well underway. Philip Williamson sums up the surprising turn of events as follows, quote, The national government's survival of the loss of the gold standard appears so effortless that in retrospect it can seem as if no problem existed. Of course, the government was assisted by its very character as a broad-based coalition commanding wide political confidence, despite foreign financiers' anxiety about the effects of an election. It also commanded financial and business support for its reassertion of sound budgetary practice. In essence, taking the decision to come off gold in September, with the national government in place and most importantly with a balanced budget was very different from coming off gold in August in an uncontrolled way with a failing labor minority government and a yawning budget deficit. Undoubtedly, the reaction to Britain coming off gold on the financial markets would not have been sanguine or calm had it been in August, and many of the dire warnings about financial panic and collapsing currency would have been likely in such a scenario. It was only the changed political circumstances of September that made an abandonment of gold a feasible option. What the events of the 16th to the 21st of September had done, however, was transform the political landscape. The mission for which the national government had been formed was apparently over. But the mission the Times had set for it, of overseeing Britain's long and difficult recovery, had now taken precedence over any pressing immediate crisis, given the battle to save gold was over and the budget was balanced. There still remained political struggles to be fought over whether there should be an election, who should contest it, and on what platform. Thanks so much for watching episode 13 of The Crisis. If you enjoyed it, then consider dropping a like because it really helps us out. And if you're not already, then consider subscribing to never miss another episode. As well as that, as always, we'd like to thank our patrons, including our executive producers, Eustace Abel, Jeremy Marcou, Tom McCool, and Tony Turin for helping to support the show. Thanks so much, and see you in the next episode.